Good afternoon again. Um, we are here gathered for the MENA Theatre Makers, uh, Makers Alliance fourth annual convening at Potrero Stage in San Francisco, California, um, uh, part of the Reorient Festival of Short Plays at Golden Fred Productions. Um, just for the folks who are tuning in now for the online session, just to give a little bit of context here. Um, this is the first public um, session of the convening and um, we did a last minute change because of the situation that's happening today in Palestine. My name is Sahar Asaf. I'm the Executive Artistic Director of Golden Thread Productions and I would like to start, thank you, by acknowledging that we are here gathered on the Ramayatush Oroni land known colonially today as San Francisco, California. And um, we cannot make this acknowledgement today without acknowledging the settler colonialism and the genocide that is happening in Gaza right now as we speak. Um, we're very uh, um, moved by the Palestinian artists re responding to this call that we put out to say, we wanna give the space of the first public session, which was supposed to be um, a different session, post theater post COVID, uh, but we made this last minute change because we all need to hear from the Palestinian artists. And I wanna thank so much our Palestinian artists here on the stage and also via the screen, Hannah Aidi, Maya Nazal, and Mama Ghanouj, and Manar um, Izraq, forgive me. Um, and I'm here gonna be facilitating this session with Andrea Saf from art to action who are co-producing the MENA Theater Makers Alliance convening this year. Um, I wanna, before we, um, before I give the, the mic to Andrea, I just wanna invite our founder, Turanja Gezarian, to give a little bit of context about the, com the Golden Thread has, is, uh, this is our 27th, 28th year, I can't do the math right now. We were founded in 1996, and we've been um, a place for diverse stories and also a voice against injustices everywhere and of all kinds. So I wanna just give the mic to Taranj to speak a little bit about the, the our mission and Golden Thread's support of the Palestinian cause. Hi everyone, I'll be, I'll be brief. I just wanted to remind us that Golden Thread's inaugural production was an adaptation of Lysistrata called Operation No Penetration, where <laughs> Palestinian and Israeli women unite to bring about peace, which feels like something we might need um, soon. Um, we have a long history of producing plays by Palestinian playwrights. I believe that we have produced more plays by Palestinian playwrights than any theater company in the United States. Uh, we hosted uh, a weekend of uh, Palestinian plays from uh, playwrights who, Palestinians who reside in what is known as Israel today, 90, 1948ers, to those who live in the uh, occupied territories, to those who live in diaspora. So we have produced a range of uh, um, Palestinian voices. Um, and I would say that one of the greatest assets that Golden Thread has is our audience and our diverse community of artists. Because, uh, you know, preaching to the choir is not a big deal in my mind. What we bring is diversity, we bring dialogue. We have also produced plays by anti-occupation Israeli playwrights, and we have hosted dialogue sessions among our community. In fact, for many years, Reorient Festival would feature a play by a Palestinian playwright and a play by an Israeli playwright, which was our way of bringing a diverse audience to the house so that we could fa facilitate dialogue. So I take pride in that. That is sort of the legacy that I have brought, I'm kind of a historic figure in the room. Um, and and um, that's our legacy, it's in your hands now, so you take it where you think it needs to go. Um, but uh, I feel like we need each other more than ever, uh, and I'm interested in this space, and I'm proud of all of you. Hi, Hannah. Um, and 
um, yeah, eager to uh, hear. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Asaf, and um, despite this rumor we're trying to start, we're not actually related, <laughs> as far as we know. Um, uh, and I'm just here to remind us for a moment uh, that we did make community agreements in the morning and uh, to keep those fresh, and I will remind us of them if that is needed. Um, however, we will be uh, really using our time to listen to the panelists who have joined us, and we won't be open, opening a full dialogue. So this is a practice of deep listening, and then we'll have lots of opportunities to dialogue throughout the rest of our time together. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we are being recorded, live streamed, and archived on the internet through HowlRound. So that's something folks might want to keep in mind. And um, that one of the, when we were making the decision to change this panel, um, part of that process was a conversation of uh, board members and committee members were having about how we were just checking in about how we were feeling. And Taranj raised the question that I, th that I would like to offer as a framing question for our conversation today, which is, what is the role of the artist in times of war, crisis, and genocide? What is our role in this time? And that's just may or may not thread through the conversation as, as we share time today. Thank you, Andrea. All right, so um, we're gonna begin uh, directly with introductions, and I would like to invite our artists here, and we'll start, we'll start with you, Hannah, uh, via the screen. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, feel free to say your name, artistic practice, uh, where you're from, uh, and where you're based now, whatever those mean to you. Um, let's keep it brief at the top, and then I'll come back with the second question. So, Hannah, Fadal. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hanna Aidi. Um, I'm a theater artist, uh, mostly directing plays, but uh, somehow uh, the pandemic made me a, a, a disciplined playwright, gave me all the time I need to, to write. So I've been writing for our, um, our uh, company that I founded in Seattle, Dunia Productions. Um, I'm a Palestinian from uh, a Palestinian village in the north, close to you, um, <laughs> to Lebanon. Uh, the name is Bukaya, uh, and I'm based uh, in Seattle now in the US. Thank you so much for being here. Maya? Hello, I'm Maya Nazal. Um, I'm Palestinian American. I am an actor and a screenwriter, and I grew up in San Jose, in California my whole life, but I also grew up in Syria, Damascus, Syria, and Amman, Jordan. So I had experience in both the East and the West, and I went to school there as well. So my upbringing kind of has influenced the way I approach my art in terms of what, how I know a Middle Eastern um, from the Middle East would approach the stories of Palestinians and how someone from the outside who's never even heard of the country would approach it. And that's something I take into account with everything I create. Sorry, that's my introduction, but it's very in-depth. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Mama Ganous. Uh, I'm a drag artist, I'm a drag queen. I am based in San Francisco. I am black and Palestinian. Uh, my Palestinian heritage comes from Gaza, where mo most of my mother's family are right now, and my Palestinian heritage also comes from Yaffa um, originally, but they're all refugees in Elibrej, which is a refugee camp that is in center Gaza since 1948. Uh, I grew up uh, mostly in Cairo, Egypt, um, because both of my parents were not allowed to enter Palestine. And now I am uh, based in San Francisco for the past 14 years. I have House Ganoush. It's a drag house full of Swana queer folks. And I run the events uh, on an open mic called Voco AF at Queer Arts Featured, which is the Harvey Milk camera shop in the Castro. Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad to be here. 
Hello, everyone. Marhaba. Salam. My name is Manar Ezraik, and I am a minister for the soul. I lead the humanity to connect with the divine aspect of themselves. Based on the Sufi traditions, we have there are 99 names of Allah, and these are attributes that uh, lives in every single one of you, every single one on this earth. And so I'm going to offer a chant uh, song from, from the Islamic uh, mystic tradition known as Sufism. I'm Palestinian, born and raised in Israel. In 1948, uh, the village where I'm from in Ailaboun, north of uh, Palestine, Israel, we, mo we became refugees in Lebanon. And we are, we are the first and the only, um, the second, two, two villages returned after the 1948 back to the land, and Ailaboun is one of them. I say that because uh, it's important to go back to the roots. And so I have many identities. I am an Israeli, I'm Palestinian, I'm atheist, I'm Christian, I'm Hindu, I'm none of it, I'm all of it. I am the chaos and the mess, and I am the peace as well. So I'm very grateful to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Shukran jazilan, shukran min a'maqi qalbi. Um, you start, you need to start with Manar, sorry. Okay, uh, I should have left the mic with you, but you, is that working for you? Great. Um, Manar, uh, our next question for everyone on the panel is, how are you really, and how are you holding up in this moment? And Manar, would like to start with you, and I know that you wanted to offer a prayer so I should pray or answer first. Libidia. <laughs> um. I'm pausing because I have many feelings coming through and many thoughts. Um. How am I? I am in conversation with my beloved family every night. I talk to them from my mother, three generations, four generations, all the way until a 13 year old nep nephew, George. Um, I listen to their stories and what's going on in their bodies. Uh, as a somatic uh, healer, I like to help them as much as I can and um, but I felt that trembling even though I'm so far away from the land the motherland the wounded land um, I just listen to their stories and their bodies and try to help with some um, uh, different methods how to breathe how to to tune into self-care, how to get away from the mind. So I am constantly doing that as part of my work. So I feel very blessed to be living in um, a retreat center where I have all what I need and more for comfort. And, um, and um, yes, uh, uh, self-care is the number one method that I, you know, anything from writing, bathing in water, praying, um, talking to a friend, processing the the rage and the, the sadness. There's a lot of uh, sadness coming through and grief. Uh, it's the mind does not, it's unfathomable. So how am I dealing with that? Utilize my method day in, day out as I'm Talking to my family, I take it. I take from them. To me, I carry this, and then I dump it back. I like energetically. I release it. 
because of what's happening, I started my own um, online. It pushed me to, to do my healing sessions um, every Friday on Zoom and in person in Sebastopol. Um, I just, I do all that I know how to do to be grounded and centered. And that being said, breath work is really the number one tool, key that I use constantly. But as I said, I have been doing that. So it helps me kind of like, yeah, listening to the body and releasing that anxiety. In fact, I will be sharing at the end of the panel a sample, an experience for all of you to, um, to, to join me. Thank you so much for asking. I hope I answered, yes? Okay, song, song. Okay, prayer. This prayer is called, in Arabic, <coughs> I'm going to speak it and then sing it and ask you to join me on the chorus. Allahumma aj'ala fi qalbi nooran wa aj'ala fi aqli nooran wa aj'ala fi hayati nooran wa aj'ala fi jasadi nooran Nuran is light. Place light in my heart. Place light in my mind, in my life, in my body. In every aspect of me, I'm calling for the light to enter me. This is this, is this chant. And so for those of you who feel comfortable to join the chorus, it goes like that. So Noor, it's the root, it's light, and Nooran is like saying Shukran and Shukur. It's the same. Nooran, Noor. So <coughs> I'll sing the chorus just for you to hear it, and feel free to join me. Try together. Noor. Yeah, ending with ar noor. Okay. Okay, thank you. A 
Ajala fi jasadi nuran nuran nu. this moment I feel really good after this so thank you <laughs> um, I'm okay um, it's like in, in Western medicine they say like they always differentiate about how you feel and your physical symptoms and things like that and it just doesn't work for me um, uh, the soon as the Palestinian genocide that it slowed down it never stopped but it escalated in Gaza recently and also the West Bank um, I had a full-blown MS relapse I have multiple sclerosis I live with it I had a relapse three months ago and I've been struggling with it and all that stress doesn't doesn't help um, so this morning I have pain all over my body and I feel deep inside me that my, my genes are screaming. Um, epigenetics says that you inherit your parents' trauma, their DNA. You also inherit their strength, your ancestors' strength and their stories. But today the trauma has been triggered. Um, I lost 170, over 170 people, sorry, not lost, Israel killed 172 people and trauma warning um, the past like two weeks since like the Gaza escalation started and for the past six days we don't know anything about my families uh, both of the my families are in Gaza the Yaffa side are refugees in a camp and the Gaza side are it's all 25 miles we're 25 kilos um, so that has been really scary um, and I feel very helpless, um, and I feel very devastated with all the media and everything else. Like, uh, I'm very disappointed, but I realized we live in a colonizing nation, uh, and I was like, oh gosh, yeah, I never felt this way. This is a colonizing nation that we live in, and our president is a war criminal. Um, so it's... It's been really sad. Um, I also felt today coming here, I saw a protest, so I felt, I was like, maybe hope is not what we need to do right now, for me at least, um, because hope comes with me with my connection with God and deity, and unfortunately, after the injustice in Gaza, that was the last strike of losing faith in any deity for me. Uh, because if there is a God, he would have protected these people. Uh, it is just straight up injustice. But what I'm really leaning into right now is dignity. And I feel like my family, I had to be in this place just because I was born from Palestinian parents and I have to advocate for them. And that's part of my dignity. So I'm here to honor the, my, my family's losses and the Palestinian losses and also the Armenian losses and the Haitian losses that are happening right now due to this country. Um, so, yeah, but I am very grateful. And at this moment right now, my body is 
very much in peace. So thank you. I appreciate you. I'm so sorry for your losses. I can't imagine what it's like to have all of your family there and your roots are there, but you being here right now, you are a survivor of that. And that's something that I remind myself and that's how I've been feeling as a survivor. Um, because being Palestinian is not, it's not being on that land, it's not about land. Like to me, it's never been about land and I don't even believe in telling all of our Palestinian family to stay there and fight for this land because I'm not there fighting for this land. Why am I telling you to die for this land? I think being Palestinian is, is just existing in the world with that culture, with that spirit, and with that name. And everything you do and everything you are, like you're a storyteller, you're a Palestinian storyteller, you're a Palestinian actor, you're a Palestinian author, you know, that's, that is what it means to be Palestinian. It's holding that culture and that history in everything that you do. So that's just for you to know you are, you are all of that. Um, I think how I'm feeling is just suffocating. That's the word I can, the only word that I can describe is I feel I'm suffocating. I have no words. I honestly was even scared to speak today because I don't even have words. I don't even know how to talk about it. But um, calling my grandma, she is a refugee. My, all my grandparents um, were refugees from Palestine to Syria. And she's in Syria, so she can't even talk about it on the phone. Like, she's scared to talk about it. S and this is their history. They're reliving it, and she can't even speak. Like, she's literally just staring at me, and I'm literally on the phone, and I, she's the only person I want to comfort. I'm like, how are you? Alhamdulillah, tamam. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. That's it, that's all I can get, and her eyes are crying. I mean, she's not really crying because she has to numb herself so much that she doesn't even have to talk about it anymore. Um, but she used the word suffocating. She's like, I'm not in it. And that's the, after she said that, that's the only way I could really describe it. Um, I feel so cynical. I feel like the only way to deal with it is there's no human way to justify what's happening. I can't say, I, I don't even feel like fighting with people. I don't even feel like telling people that, um, that it's wrong. I have to be cynical. I have to be like, this is just God's plan. Like it makes me more religious and just say this is how it has to be. I feel numb to it. I feel like I have to just numb all emotions and accept it as, part of life like it's happened before and it's going to happen again and it's going to happen to someone if it's not palestinians so i yeah i feel like it's dark i i hate saying that even because it takes away so much from the feelings of what's happening right now but i like it's helpless like i don't know there's nothing i can do just posting feels like preaching to the choir I don't know, everyone who follows me is knows I'm Palestinian, so they probably wouldn't befriend me if they hated Palestine, so I'm just preaching out to people who support, right? But <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Um, I feel really good to be able to talk right now because it feels like it's effective. I'm talking to people and I'm we're able to share a story, so this makes me feel a little bit better. So I really thank you guys for having us. Hannah, Hannah. Well, um, just like everybody else who's far from home, I call home. I call my family. I call my mother. Um, she she talks more than anybody else, but all the young, all the brothers and sisters, um, long pauses of silence. They just don't say much. Um, and I call them also to get the news. I, I feel like I'm living in a free country where there's a lot of news, you know, 150 TV stations on my TV and I get nothing except lies and propaganda. So I call them to tell the, to, to get the truth from them, sadly. Um, uh, and I am trying to 
stay busy with uh, with one show we planned um to open last thursday uh, a show by palestine the return and had nothing to do with the with the crisis that we're living in now but um we considered canceling uh but then i thought why i mean uh this play is so so timely was timely still timely and will always be timely as long as the Palestinian people are not free. Um, we should go on. So the show goes on. So what we do every night um, as a group of artists is uh, another moment of silence before we do the show. How many moments of silence we go through? How many breaks can we get? How many wars we have to endure? Um, uh, we also hold uh, a support group at the same building where the theater is. Uh, my daughter is a therapist and she called a lot of young people, um, Palestinians and Lebanese and Egyptians and Jordanians, a lot of the Arab community here in Seattle to see if they want to get together. And we were surprised how many people wanted to come. They all showed up just to hold each other and cry together. Unfortunately, they're all women. Men somehow don't want to cry, but I, on the phone, they, they mentioned to me that they are looking for an address. They're looking for a place where they can feel safe to cry because somehow we are expected to be a polite victim, a victim that doesn't get angry. We have to be careful what we see, what we say and what we do. Um, Sadly, we are probably <laughs> the only kind of a victim in this era that lost its humanity. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a victim that uh, has to censor itself before we say anything. I know friends of mine in Palestine can't even click like on Facebook because they're afraid that can be, they, they can be picked up from home by the Israeli police, um, and it's happening. They're warning them not to even share anything on Facebook. So that's what we do um, from far away. And I was actually surprised that, you know, we call them to comfort them because we're safe. I was surprised that members of my family who lived in 1948 reached out. These are the real refugees, the real, the first victims of the Israeli colonization of Palestine, they are calling to comfort us. Imagine, you know, people who've been homeless for 75 years calling Palestine and Palestinians to comfort them to be okay. So that's where we are. Um, we have to be selective here of what we see and what we watch because, because it hurts, it hurts a lot to to screen through the lies and and screen through the media that is um, a participant, an active participant in this war crime, sadly. So thank you for creating this platform for us to express my, ourselves and, and our feelings. Appreciate it. I want to remind everyone to breathe. Take a deep breath, and that this is a space where it's okay to cry. I mean, we're theater people. We can scream and cry. <laughs> um, and to stay grounded, because we know how hard it is to witness. And we can o only imagine how hard it is to live everything that we're talking about. Yeah. So I'm just going to remind us to keep breathing. Um, and a bit of moment of transparency to say we wanted to just start with the question, how are you? Um, because, because of the media censorship of Palestinian stories, because we don't actually know what it is on the daily to be in Palestine. And we wanted to begin there uh, with just like the humanity of 
how are you right now in this moment? Um, and to be able to talk about that, right? And uh, now we're going to continue that conversation into how are we, how are you as artists? Um, because I, I just want to say that censorship is real and censorship happens in so many ways th through the media, through funding, through what gets produced and what doesn't, through what we feel like we're allowed to say, through what we're allowed to like on social media. I mean, the extremity of that, right? Um, so how the question, the next question is um, to just an invitation to tell us about your lived experience as a Palestinian artist in this moment and what it means, what that means to you and how and or how you address Palestinian experience in your work as an artist. Um, really anywhere you want to go um, with that question. It's a very good question for me um, because um, I left Jerusalem in 2006 and for those of you who know me or know some um, the history of a Palestinian Israeli, it's very, very narrow place to live in. It's a, you're compromised comp constantly because you're a minority. So being in that narrow place, living in the Holy Land from birth until I was 31. Um, I wasn't able to express myself as an artist. Yes, honey. Habibi. Allah khalik, tislam. Thank you. But one thing I can say that all my struggles, you know, as a bilingual, biracial, bi bisexual, by bi everything, gender, two-spirit, uh, I never really fit anywhere. And I was living in that narrow place and um, I was not able to sing back home, not even a drum. However, all my frustration, I channeled it on a judo mat. And I became the national uh, judo champion for s <laughs> of Israel for seven consecutive years. So I'm a black belt, and if you want to mess up with me, that's that's fine. <laughs> all I can all I can do is protect you now. I I don't fight anymore. But that being said, I lived in Jerusalem after being in the national championship and being the only Palestinian there and holding the title for so long, uh, not being able to s to, s to voice uh, myself my my body spoke, but not my voice until I moved to Jerusalem. And I became a Waldorf teacher. And there, with all these amazing tools from the uh, Dr. Steiner, I was able to open up uh, my chakras and uh, sing. Uh, my voice opened, my truth, everything opened. And th that being said, I had to leave so I can be a singer, so I can be true to myself, so I can follow my calling. Uh, as a healer, I help people open their voice. So. Um, to free Palestine, you have to free women. That's something I heard with the lesbian Jordanian couple who came to San Francisco because they couldn't be, be they couldn't share publicly the love that they have for each other. So they moved and uh, they said, why not freeing women, freeing Palestine? It's the same thing, kind of like my m much more, more, more important. Actually, all of it, all of it. But for me, to free women is to free their voice. And that's uh, what I'm focusing on, to free my voice in being transparent, in speaking everything, how I feel and what I want and what I desire. It's uh, all of it. And help others access that th throat chakra because that's um, the, th the truth, you hold the truth. It's also the expression of your heart, it's this chamber of the heart. It's the God within you. So speaking, singing is what I'm here to do on planet Earth, is to sing, to heal, and sing to empower you, and so I continuously doing that. 
uh, everywhere I go here in the Bay Area, and I have such an amazing support. Uh, I, I literally live in a retreat center <laughs> where I can host re retreats. But I, um, yeah, wanna I wanna expand my service, and so ho hoping that um, this stage will help me manifest that. Um, it's important to speak your voice, no matter how trembling, no matter what, what. Um, what is the energy, the, the, what locks you in? What, what pres you, we all have a prison inside of us. We all live in this prison, right? In the mind and we're afraid of judgment and how people see us and what if I say my truth? What if I have this need and blah, blah, blah. So it's just like, just all, to free Palestine, free your voice. First of the woman, the beloved next to you, <laughs> or the man next to you, please free yourself. You have the power, so yes, to voice uh, voice your everything. Um, and thank you so much. Shukran jazilan. <coughs> this is this is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, I felt you when you're talking about how. Um, being like being a Palestinian who ended up in Israel, a lot of people don't talk about the traumas that uh, Palestinians that stayed in the 1948, the green zone as they call it, um, um, have survived deportation, something very similar to what Stalin did to a lot of Jewish folks and Polish folks and Ukrainian folks uh, in World War II. This is what happened to Palestinians who stayed in Israel. Uh, a lot of them were deported. They had a lot of limitations. Israel is not a state that is very progressive when it comes to their own citizens. There is a lot of history about sterilizing flasher Jews, like black Jews, similar to what the US did, like the country who invented eugenics. Um, so I just, I heard you, and yeah, sorry if I startled you, <laughs> just apologies. Um, uh, as an artist, it's really difficult to be um, a bearded drag queen. <laughs> 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 it's really hard to be a gender fluid trans person. Um, cis gays are very angry about non-binary pronouns. <laughs> I don't know why. It's like, you know, God invented Adam and Steve, not Raina and Reese. You know, they're very angry. Um, yeah, and this is the same. We call them vodka soda gays. They give good tips at the bar. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of cis white privilege, like a lot of testosterone. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's been already hard. So being Palestinian too, that's been really hard because people literally boycott me now because I'm Palestinian and then ask me to uh, explain Hamas and explain Palestine for them. I was like, I'm a drag queen. I literally do. <laughs> I flip wigs, I do Diana Ross, um, like not Nina Simone really a lot. Just, I'm a Nina person. I do a lot of sabah, a lot of word, a lot of like Arabic divas that we love. Um, but also coming from a family that's like pretty much like Jabha uh, Shabir, um, we are activists by birth. Like we, so we have to give something political. If it's not about Palestine, it's about Armenia. If it's not about Armenia, it's about like any anything. Like black folks in America, that's part of my heritage too. And Latin Americans and Asian Americans, all of these people. Um, however, the past two weeks has been really, really stressful. Uh, we have safety, our safety is compromised. Like we, we I got death threats, I'm a drag queen. Um, I get uh, things like that. I also got really angry folks um, that are unfortunately gay. Like I'm not talking about like your like cis hetero next door neighbor. It's your gay next door neighbor. Um, that I was surprised by the uh, the pink washing that's happening in this country. So really, I'm really focusing on educating people about two things in my art right now, about you can't really have queer rights, human rights in Gaza or the West Bank because these are concentration camps. These are not cities. These are not well-governed cities. Gaza is the biggest open prison in the whole world. 
Uh, so if you go to Tel Aviv Pride and have fun, it doesn't mean that this is the gayest, more queerest area. Experience Israeli gay scene as a trans queer person, and you will understand how horribly misogynist, how horribly discriminatory it is, similar to a lot of different gay scenes. This is not gay heaven. And it also reminds me of uh, how in the US they had uh, Filipinos um, captured basically and brought into human zoos that the US had. And then when they have Filipino refugees coming here or Vietnamese or anyone else, they would call them like they liberated them. They're coming for liberation while you have literally showed them around as animals. Um, so I just wanted to educate the queer community and, um, and liberals in this country that the problem in Palestine, that this is a concentration camp. Like, also, Palestine was a well-governed like, country, a state before the colonization, that, that never had any sodomy laws. Like, we did not have any laws against being gay or queer in Palestine, in our constitution, after the Ottoman Empire. We never had any of this. Um, the other thing I'm focusing on, in addition to pinkwashing, is really representation. Um, we are, um, in our form of art, we all advocate in different ways, and we need to talk about trans folks and queer folks as Palestinians, because we also exist. We're not just dehumanized women like yelling over their, their, their destroyed homes, which is basically, unfortunately, that's what Israel has been doing to us the entire time. We also people who live and survive. Um, so um, as an artist right now, really pink washing is a big deal for me. And the other thing is also um, representation for other unheard voices. And again, I bring back Armenia. Armenia is a country has been like, genocided 100 years ago. In the past two weeks, they have 100,000 over Armenians deported from their lands, and Azaris are using Israeli weapons. Um, so we need to talk about this, and this country doesn't even mention that because they're benefiting from this. So um, I, I really would hope anyone else in the room here who's an artist just to kind of advocate to our allies first that are basically against us at this moment, which makes it very difficult. Thank you. Um, as an artist, I've always liked fairy tales. I love magical things and I love stories that have like very enchanting characters that are ridiculous. Like I love ridiculous things that happen. And I was just in Palestine a few months ago and um, I was in Jerusalem and this man, this very, very old man, I mean, he looked like a wizard. He really looked like a wizard. <laughs> Me and my sister are walking past and he comes out of the shop and he's like, you can come in. <laughs> and he just knew that my sister wanted to go in. She didn't say anything. She didn't look at the shop. She didn't even tap on my shoulder. And he's like, you can come in. And she's like, oh my God, I actually wanted to go in there. And we were in there for two hours. <laughs> for two hours, just me and her, and he put us in a little nook, and he had, um, I'm not sure what it was called, but like a respirator, right? And um, so he couldn't speak, and his voice sounded like, it, it was such a character voice, I don't know, like you could kind of hear him, but it was very, it was, yeah, but it was, it was like a character. And he brought out this genie lamp, and he gives it to us, and he's like, <laughs> make three wishes, in Arabic. and. He's like putting my sister in front of the mirror and sh he's brushing her hair and he's telling her all of her insecurities. And he's like, am I right? And she's like, yes. And she starts crying and he gives us necklaces and lockets and then he sends us on our way and he, he, it was a wizard. It was just the most magical experience of my life. And it was on the holiest land of the world. It was in Jerusalem. And he's told us his family name and it went back so far, like from the beginning of Palestine. And it was, the most beautiful start to my trip there. I went there for research for screenwriting. So with that same energy I got from this wizard man, <laughs> um, I went to visit my family in Kalkilia. So Kalkilia is my actual city. There are 10,000 Nizals, which is my family name. Um, my entire family is there. And it is a circle completely surrounded by the wall. Like the apartheid wall, there's one way in and when there's one way out. And IDF, 
everywhere. I mean, like going in there from Jerusalem, like the holiest, most magical place, it was like a nightmare, like a horror, horror story. And so we go in there and you can tell that these people do not feel the presence of this wall at all. Like there's no holy site anywhere. It is a wall. The beach is five minutes from my aunt's house. She has no access to it. The airport is 10 minutes away. They have to literally go all the way to Amman, Jordan to fly to another country. And the airport is 10 minutes away. So they are in a suffocating occupation, my family. Like it is not a minor occupation, it's suffocating. But they are so happy in there. I mean, like they're like, let's go get smoothies, let's go get milkshakes. Let's it had the same energy as this wizard man. And <laughs> I remember being like, I felt more oppressed than them, and I'm not even from there, right? I'm I was born in America, I'm coming to visit, and I don't know what it's like, but obviously someone from the outside is gonna feel it way more. They're so used to it. That's why they call us and they check on us to see if we're okay because they're used to it. They, they don't feel it as much anymore. They feel scared, they feel sad, but they don't feel it. Um, and I just got all these ideas for this show that I'm writing. And I think the main thing that I wanna focus on as an artist is the humanizing of these people as, as like dreamers, as people, as, as people who like chocolate or like hate the sand at the beach, like they just hate the feeling of sand. Like I, I don't wanna see Palestinians as just these people that are suffering and dying. Like I don't want our, our legacy to be that, even though that is a huge part of who we are and it should always be talked about. I, I wanna show the humanization of that and I think that's what I wanna do as an artist. And so I'm writing a TV show. Um, I've been in theater for 10 years, so I'm like, I am a theater artist, but I'm going into film and TV as well. But um, I got the idea for this show really quick. I'll tell you this beautiful story of my family. Um, my grandpa was a month old, and my grandma had seven kids, and they were exiled out, out of Safad, which is now completely Israel, like there's no Arab there ever, and that's where my entire mom's family's from, that entire city. Um, they were exiled and she had to walk her seven children from, from Safad all the way to Damascus. And she couldn't bring anything with her. And my grandpa was a month old, he was crying, he was sick, he was, he was such a burden. So she actually considered putting him on the ground and leaving him to die. And she did, she actually left him there and they walked and then his dad came back and grabbed him and was like, there's no way we are leaving him. That was my grandpa, like I literally would not even be alive right now. Um, they keep walking, they get to Damascus. The only thing she was able to bring was a gold necklace. And so when they get there, they're all sharing seven, seven kids and two adults all sharing one bedroom. After a while, my grandma comes up with, my great grandma comes up with the idea to sell this gold necklace for a sewing machine. Um, she sells it for a sewing machine and everyone thought she was absolutely insane because a gold necklace, right? She teaches all of her kids how to sew and eventually they created the biggest fashion empire in all of Syria. Yeah. And they are refugees, they had no money, and the whole idea actually came from my grandpa who was gonna get left on the sand. He ran the entire thing along with his brothers, but he was like the big boss su succession man. And, um, <laughs> and I just thought that story is so magic. Like that is a Palestinian story. Like that's courage, that's bravery, that's like, risk taking, like that is Palestine. And that's what I wanna do as an artist. I think, I, I obviously wanna touch on war, I wanna touch on oppression, but what happens after that? Like we can do more, we can overcome that. Like let's show them what we can do and like what he did. And I'm so proud of my family and I'm so proud to be Palestinian and I wanna represent that, yeah. Hannah, what about you? Well, as the Palestinian experience <laughs> through my work, it, it, it's my life. Basically, I, I've been doing theater um, at a younger age in the village before I left Palestine. Um, and I, I think I felt the impact of, of doing theater 
at a younger age that it just stayed with me for the rest of my life. Um, it was a village that, you know, didn't have running water or electricity. Uh, the only form of entertainment was uh, festivals, you know, holidays. And we did a play at the village square, you know, um, right by the spring in the middle of the village where people watched the play from from their balconies and roofs. And, and, uh, and the day after, little kids would be running after me chanting some of the punchlines and, and and I knew there was something about theater um and from there on I uh, continued with you know professional theater company in Haifa and then I left to the U.S. to study theater to find out whether Shakespeare was a an Arabian poet or an Englishman because we thought he was an Arab uh, an Arab poet um and it stayed with me. I mean, I really think uh, my life um, in theater is is like somebody who's who has a disease that can't rid of it. Um, and I've been doing plays, whether there is war or not. But I somehow got the accusation or reputation, if you will, that every time I do a play, a war breaks out. Um, I wish that's true. I wish I have that power. Then I can stop the play to stop the war, but I can't. Um, there's um, there's something about starting a play when you're in the middle of war, because uh, I, I, I'm actually re remembering that even the play that we just opened last Thursday um, had its premiere in Haifa uh, when an Arabic uh, theater company, Al Midan Theater in Haifa, uh, took it. And I insisted at the time that we can find an Israeli uh, translator to translate the play to Hebrew so the Israeli audience can come and view the play and understand it. So luckily, the artistic director there or the manager, Adnan Tarabshi, agreed with me and we found somebody who translated the play and for the first time in Haifa at Al Midan Theater, a play in Hebrew in front of a mixed audience, Palestinians, Israelis, and, and Jewish Israelis in the same space watching the play. And it was very powerful to, to the point where the Minister of Culture, Mary Regev at the time, that was uh, 2014, Actually, we were rehearsing while bombing were falling on Gaza in 2014. That's just another war. Um, she decided, the Minister of Culture, to close the theater after three performances. Not just because of our play, but there was another play with uh, about Palestine in that theater company. And the company is still closed. The theater is closed since 2014. And that's been my my life story in 19 actually even before that in 1991 i took one piece from the mime troupe the san francisco mime troupe um after mandela was released from prison and we opened january 15 when the bombs were falling on baghdad um and now we're doing a play when the bombs are falling on on gaza so i don't know when we can get a break I don't know if we if we have to wait for the war to be over as as theater artists to do a play, we would be waiting for a long time. There's always a war. There's always conflict. There's always crisis. Actually, uh, what's his name? Uh, Oliver Stone said that that the U.S. conducted 14 wars in the last 30 years. Um, so. How do we deal with it now? I mean, it, it's so hard for us to 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 do anything, you know, you, as an artist, as a, somebody who, who would like to write a play. I mean, I ask every night, I, I am asked every night, what are you writing right now? Even, you know, on NPR, they ask me, uh, so what's your next play? I said, I don't know. I, I have to wait for the war to, to be over. I have to wait for the dust to, to settle, to find out whether my people survived or not. I mean, this is... A, a genocide you can't just sit down and take a, a quiet moment and and write 
um, you have to wait it to to stop, and you have to give it a break. And and I think it's almost like when you when you're writing a play, you have to dig yourself out of the rubble, um, out of the news, out of the noise of the war to be able to write. Um, it, writing a play is almost in the same process. You have all these ideas, all these images that just fall on you. And then at the end, you say, okay, now I'm ready to write. And what you do is really throw away some of it and find the one that catches you. Find that image that says, okay, this is it. My play is about that, that what, what I call commanding image that is just gonna grow into a play. Whether that image stays with you at the end of the play or not, whether it ends up in a trash can, you don't know. But but we really have to wait um, for for uh, for it to to be over. And I hope it it's soon. We're going to we're going to wrap up soon, and we want to save a little time to end with some breath work before we all move from the space. But. I have one more question, and I'm going to ask us to answer like speed round, a like, couple words, OK? Um, and it's, it's this question, what is the role of the artist in times of war, crisis, or genocide? And I want to lift up what you just said, Hannah, about, in fact, there has never been a time in US history that we have not, as a country, been engaged in a war either fighting it or funding it, or in a proxy war. There has never been a time in US history that we have not, as an imperial power, been engaged in war. Not on the land. Yeah, not always on this land. Oh. But in the, uh, yes. You, you can look, look it up. Uh, <laughs> but I, really, so what is the role of the artist, and not just the Palestinian artist or the artist that is under bombardment now, but all of us as artists. Couple words. It, uh, this is huge, what you just said. It's absolutely incredible. Give us homework. <laughs> okay. So as a two-spirit being, being oppressed, repressed in the Holy Land, I wasn't able to speak the uh, masculine part of myself, only on the judo mat, that's why I won. <laughs> However, voice, I did not have a voice. I was told it's aib, meaning shame on you to even think that you, aib is Arabic word for shame. Every other word in Arabic, at least my experience, is aib. You don't know how to deal with something, is aib. Anything that is not God is aib. Oh. خلاص تعبنا يعني إنه it's very tiring you know والله العظيم so when I found my voice in Jerusalem and I saw that wall built around Jerusalem to to separate Palestinians from coming to uh, the land of what we know to be Israel and just remind you I'm both Israeli and Palestinian so and I'm both genders and so that voice that was shut down by both my family, my culture, the Arab culture, and being a Palestinian and shutting my voice as a minority because now it's the time for the Israel to, to take on the land, take on, this is their narrative, this is their land, this is their country, la 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 la. So if we, Kind of like I look at myself as a two-spirit, both gender, transgender. I gave myself a gift. I came to this country so I can free my voice and unfold, allow my masculinity to really to be expressed in whichever way that I needed, knowing that back home I was not allowed to. So we all have both we have many jo voices, right? So I freed myself and I'm really, I hope I'm leading the way to encourage you to, leading the way with my methods and with my healing and my story to find that repressed voice in you 
that, as he said beautifully, we inherit from our parents the good, the bad, and the unique. And so the ancestral wound, we all carry that genetic uh, makeup, and we have ancestral wounds from whatever heritage you're coming from, escaping coming to this land, immigrant of three generations, five generations, two generations, I don't know. I'm just saying this is a human story. We are all immigrants. Uh, I mean, it's still happening. If I'm not going to take your home down, I'm going to ask you to leave and start over. Your story, start somewhere else. And so the women's voice, we need to empower women and the immigrant voice because we carry all these wounds of re... Um, uh, re uh, yeah, and the, uh, rebuild your life, restart over, recreate yourself. The beautiful story of the Syrian, like, yani, yeah, beautiful transformation. But the voice, the voice of that repressed energy, if it's still in you, it's your responsibility, it's our responsibility. We're all artists, we're all spiritual beings, we all have creative forces. We're, my voice was shut down, my creative voice was shut down back home, but I found a way to, uh, to, to voice it and gosh, I am just about to publish my first book, by the way. I say that because it's like so much creative power within us all. And I encourage you to voice that and encourage so many others to do so. Thank you for allowing me to speak on that. Thank you. Shukran. Um, thank you so much. Um, the judo mat thing, I, I flooded the basement multiple times. I was like, this is so good. I need you. Uh, yeah, and we're going to talk about also the vocal piece. Um, I would love to do that. So thank you so much. Um, it's so awesome to be around these Palestinian and queer artists and everyone else here. It's pretty awesome. Um, so I want to just mention one thing, and I'll be very brief, I promise. Uh, we are writing history as artists. Um, and history is usually written by people who are in power, but also at some point, in the future version of UC Berkeley or something else, you will find some book about these bunch of people like Golden, Golden Threat Theater who did this play about Palestinian indigenous folks. And oh, by the way, these people were like indigenous. So you are, as an artist, part of writing history. Um, so always remember this. Um, and I have three things that I feel like is our responsibility as artists right now is first honoring ourselves. So to honor yourself means if your existence is an act of resistance, as most Palestinians are, Armenians, women, queer folks, trans women, everyone else, then you need to self-preserve, like take care of yourself. Um, and if honoring yourself means honoring who you are by expressing art, then do that. And what, I, what my capacity right now with my MS relapse, like I'm usually the buffoon, like in theater terms, I always, I love being the buffoon. And I love being um, like the person, I'm an improv theater actor. And I do a lot of shows with drag queens about making fun of like stereotypes and things like that. But right now I'm not, I don't have the capacity to do this. So I run a healing circle with a bunch of queer and indigenous folks on Mondays at Queer Arts Featured, the Harvey Milk Store. So that's is my part of honoring myself. The second one is honoring your community, which means standing up for everyone else who's oppressed. So you have to voice the voices of um, Armenians again. I have a deep love to Armenians. You have to voice also the suffering of Lebanese folks under like very dramatic um, loss of economy and infl inflation. You have to honor Syrians, you have to honor even Ukrainians, I know they have a lot of attention, but still these are people who are getting so much suffocated by everything else. Um, so standing up also for women, there's a lot of, even in the queer community, there's a lot of misogyny felt, and it's expressed around transphobia. Um, there's a lot of like gaslighting for bisexual, pansexual folks. There's a lot of lack of representation. So if you're honoring yourself and honoring your community means honoring everyone else as oppressed, and always standing for what's right. And what's right is everybody is allowed to be whoever they want, express whatever they can, 
however, th with whatever, uh, whatever, sorry, with whatever tools they have. Um, and then as a radically queer person myself, I believe in radical consent. I believe in radical feminism. I'm sorry, not TERFs. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I'm a TERF repellent. Um, um, but, um, but yeah, standing up for TERFs, standing up for, peop for misogynist people, whether they are gay or not, standing for anti-Semitism, this is a disease, and remembering that anti-Semitism is a reason of false information. Like the Vatican Church started that centuries ago with like false information about Jewish folks and that resulted in anti-Semitism for years and suffering. And what's happening right now for Palestinians is also false information. So just remember that. And that's the last thing. So honoring yourself, honoring your community and honoring history. Contribute towards history with something. And that's your art, and that's extremely valuable because this would live beyond all our lives. So thank you. That was beautiful. Um, what was the question? <laughs> so, what do we do? What's the role? What of should you do? Um, sit with yourself and think. I just think everyone needs to sit and just think. Empathize, empathize with yourself, like figure out what is happening to you, what happened to your family, what does this mean, what do I feel about it? Take that anger, take that rage, and then when you're ready, channel it into something. But don't force yourself now because it's gonna come out from an emotional place that's really heavy that you don't even understand yet. I think you need to sit and think. And that's what I've been doing. I've been wanting to write and work on my show, but it's just been too heavy. Yeah, like you, we can't write. Um, only a few days ago, in that Kalkilia, that city I was telling my families from, the IDF stormed and murdered my 19-year-old cousin. I mean, three days ago. And I, I, like, I cannot write. And sometimes I get artist guilt because I'm thinking, well, if I'm not talking to people about it, maybe I should channel it into my work. No, I don't have to channel it into my work. I don't have to do anything right now. I can just sit and think about it and figure out what this means and who that person was to me and what that whole situation means to me. And even if you're not from Palestine, like you can sit and empathize with, what about your family? Like what are things that you can connect to in those feelings? It doesn't have to be the same trauma. Everyone has different levels of trauma and different experiences. So just sit and observe yourself, I think, and talk to yourself in the mirror. I think so. Hannah? Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, in 2006, I was in Palestine, landed on Monday, and on Wednesday, Israel invaded Lebanon one more time, the 2006 destruction of Lebanon. And one thing stuck with me since then, when Marcel Khalifi got on TV for for an angry moment. Can you imagine Marcel Khalifi angry on TV? But all he said, this is not an attack on Lebanon, on Beirut, on building, on structures, on bridges. This is an attack on our culture. This is an attack on Lebanon because it's the leading country in the Middle East with art and culture. I think this is the same thing about Palestine. Palestine was the leading country in culture and, and, and the only civilized nation in the Middle East for, for many centuries. Um, even before they discovered the oil, we were shipped to the Gulf countries to teach them how to read and write. Pendleton had a symphony, had a soccer team, had, had a, a radio station, had an airport. This is before even the, the Zionist uh, immigration to Palestine. I think we as an artist have a role, very important role. It, I'm committed to do theater work, but not just to, you know, make people laugh um, in, in a vague uh, uh, a vacuum. But, but I think we have to tell our story to be so effective, to, to make audience change their attitude, to, to make, to, to do a play where your stomach will turn and and to to make the audience uh, feel like their their the skin on their face is about to fall because the truth was told to them just two yards away on stage. Um, 
and and continue to do this kind of work without any fear. Uh, I know theaters will not be shut down here because you know uh, a sentence or a line, just like they do in Israel. But you know the the hardest and the worst um, censorship, if you if you will, here is lack of funds. So let's support each other with funds, support each other to produce our pieces, um, and and produce the unspeakable uh, topics on stage. And, and good luck for all of you with all your projects. And thank you um, for Golden Thread. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Palestinian people have been teaching life, as Rahaf Ziedi say, for the last 75 years. And you just showed us what that means. I want to thank you so much for teaching us so many things um, and for sharing your voices. I just want to uh, say that we're on time for our next session, but uh, we think this um, breath work is important for all of us. So we're going to take five minutes from our next session, Evren. Um, and folks, tech folks, if you can let the speakers in the room, that's fine. Just let them know that we're running a little behind. Thank you very much, Miranda and Wendy. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Manar, and uh, we'll follow your lead. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you. Shukran, shukran jazilan. So, the invitation is to be comfortable right now. I want you to scan your body, ask yourself, ask your body, what is comfort? And just take the moment and follow the breath cycle. Just allow the deep inhale from your nostrils to take Deep inhale, lift your upper torso as possible, and then release through your mouth. <sighs> For those of you who have masks, it's okay to keep wearing them or remove it. Just keep from your nostrils, breathe in, and release through your mouth by slightly opening. Keep the mouth open. <sighs> and the focus is on longer exhalation. So you are responsible for how you are going to manage your inner landscape, your energy. This beautiful cycle that breathes, breathe you. So I want you to focus on letting go of, oh, here's my me thinking, what, am I doing it right? I don't know. Just, just allow that thought to dissipate and stay focused on your breath. And again, the exhale. Imagine you have a straw in your mouth and you're, you're sending that out breath through the straw all the way directed to Mother Earth. You're doing fine. Just breathe. And back again. Deep inhale. And exhale. Your way. Your comfort. The longer you exhale, and remember to slightly open your mouth with your exhale, and allow a sigh, or just exhale, feel the texture. As you breathe out, listen to that dragon breath. And drop your energy when you exhale. As soon as you feel like you need oxygen, you lift any part of you that needs to enhance the in-breath. So you can lift your shoulders, head, hands, arms, or just your internal being. Breathe in. Yes, yawning is wonderful. Stretch and then relax. And that's where the focus go. Please exhale. The longer, the better. Just keep doing that. You're doing great. And, and remember that breath is breathing you. You are not in control of how breath is breathing you. You're moving out of the way to allow the cycle of breath to just become that awareness. When you drift into sleep, once you fall asleep, you have no control, not so ever, about how the breath is breathing you. So that's where this invitation is going to taking you on, allowing the 
after all this information that you took in, a lot was shared, just allow the focus to be on your exhale. That's a foundation. From there, we can build up another layer. But before I hear a real exhale, follow your own comfort and follow that which is breathing you. Allow that another exhale. Ah, and sigh. Just sigh. Any opening. Ah, relax. Ah. If it's hard to sigh, just say ah. 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 Hold that out breath with the ah, one syllable. Keep ah. Ah. Remember, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Just ah. 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 Follow the out breath. Follow that ah. Your way, your pace. Ah. Very good. Keep opening, opening to your body, opening to the breath, and definitely, ah, open to the syllable, the vowel, ah, all together, ah, ah. Very good. One more time. Ah, open, open to the breath. Open your mouth. Ah. Just exhale. That's okay. Ah. The longer you hold it, the better. Ah. And any tension you hold in your jaw or your cheek, you can massage. Facial massage is important. A lot of the tension we hold in our shoulders and neck, let go with ah, release. Ah. Ah. Only you can take care of you. Ah. Open your jaw, bring attention to the breath and ask your body, how else, how can I bring more comfort to my body right now? Is it a stretch? Is it more oxygen? Is it a facial massage? You are in charge of how you want to feel in your body. More stretch. Yes, wiggle any part of you. Stand if you need to and let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. Ah! Right now, you're allowed to scream the ah. Very good, very good. One last ah. 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 The syllable ah is the beginning of the word Allah. So everybody say, ah, ah, that's right. And now, la, la, together, Allah. Allah. 
In Arabic, the word nafas means breath. And the word similar to nafas, nafs, means soul. And so I leave you with that, that your breath is the, mo it's the key, is the most important thing because it brings you closer to your soul and the truth of the light that you hold inside of you. In fact, also in Hebrew, I must say, it's the same thing. They are the th three sister languages, Aramaic, Arabic, and Hebrew. And the word in Hebrew is neshima for breath. And listen to this, soul, mean in Hebrew, neshama. Nafs and nafas, neshima and neshama. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this. I appreciate that. Keep opening to the ah, to the Allah in you. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Allah. Tell us what, what was happening then. Uh, I think we should probably take five minutes yes. so people can Fred. leave us alone or go to the bathroom <laughs> before we pivot from this gorgeous conversation to trickier topics. Which I'm going to have to think about how to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Let's take five and then we will. Next session.